and then I give holes to you. Make holes. Yes. Yeah, the holes now. I am the host. Yes, that's good. I
I've got to use the microphone. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Um, hopefully you can all hear me, especially you at home. Peace out. All right. Yes, my name is Paul Martin. I'm the head of community. Basically, the crux of my uh, presentation to the phone is uh, basically a general overview of what biodiversity is in Hong Kong, um, understanding about citizen science, so, without further ado, Hong Kong's biodiversity. Here we go. All right. So, yes, Hong Kong has a vast amount of biodiversity territory. Um, over 3,300 different types of particular plants, over 190 types of freshwater fish, and over 200 different types of butterflies. Is an absolutely incredible view of how small this territory is and how diverse the actual um, habitats are, which actually is the reason why we have so much biodiversity in the first place. We actually saw a quick comparison with uh, England, like we always do. Hong Kong is 0.8% of land mass. However, if we do a quick tally up of what we actually have in what we have, Terrestrial mammals, yeah, we'll give them that, yeah, more than us, but everything else, we wipe the floor. We have so much more. We have over 88, well, around 88 types of reptiles here. England has seven. <laughs> amphibians, we have around 24 types of amphibians. England, seven. Okay, dragonflies, over 120. England, 30. Seven, all right, we have a hell of a lot. And of course, birds, we have our own migration of local birds. Also, in terms of our marine and freshwater biodiversity, Hong has a huge amount of biodiversity compared with people. In fact, it is a well bounded. Statistic that a certain so apparently, so according to that, we have a few words of biodiversity. Of course, it's relative to all the various habitats. We have control with that. All the hillsides, we have highways, we have rocky shores, we have amusement, tidal areas, beaches. Um, wetlands, all sorts of different things. You did a well, and you have Hong Kong. Then you have a huge river system to the west. You have lovely um, chasms, you have um, general chasms to the east. Oh, sorry, to the east. That involves the actual amount of green and all the diverse that we have here in Hong Kong. According to our friends at the National Geographic Society, citizen science tracks public participation and collaboration in scientific research. As a knowledge gaps. For example, urban ecology. As well, research has been something like mangroves or coastal ecology. Therefore, um, therefore, the sense of science is that people who are involved in this research can actually fill that gap. One way to do this is to research where we give um, citizen scientists and also their community. The audio is very spotty. Well, the try it without the mic. <laughs> it's all, it's yes, not muted. <laughs>
Because what we did last time was. Yep. So it says better when you speak into the computer. All right, so I will not wander around. I oh, shall basically sort of be rooted to the spotlight here. So. <laughs> Can you all hear me at home? <laughs> yes, yes, no. All right, sweet. <laughs> okay. All right, yes, now. Is there any way of turning you off a minute? Sorry for you at home. I can still hear you, I promise. Okay, so yes, yeah, citizen science. It is a great way of actually engaging the public with proper experts, with ecologists in actually co uh, collecting meaningful data itself, depending on the project itself. Wow, much better, thank you. I appreciate that. Get out. Okay. <laughs> All right, guys, peace <laughs> um, Let me just uh, add that in. Okay. So which leads us on to iNaturalists. <laughs> Please put it onto presentation mode. Fine. <laughs> All right. There right. you go. Is that better? Can you quickly summarize the first few slides again? What did we miss? I'll tell you what, I'll summarize it for, um, at the end, and especially for the Q&A. Hopefully that's okay with everybody. Um, okay, yes. You're going to see every single uh, message that's on the board there. Okay, that's okay. All right, so iNaturalist. Has anybody got iNaturalist here? Not you at home. Okay, yes, all right, fantastic. The rest of you, shame. But this is basically what I'm here for. I'm going to tell you a little bit about iNaturalist and how it works. So the first thing you should know is it's free. It's my favorite number. Okay, free, absolutely. So it is a platform which has been created by the California Academy of Sciences and the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Basically, the basic tenets of ecology is as such. What did you write? Uh, sorry, what did you take a picture of? Your photo is your evidence, the date and location is logged and the description. So basically what how it works is if you are going to work or going to school or going on a hike or being on a beach or even up you're on your boat looking at some jellyfish in the in the ocean you can take a picture of this upload it onto iNaturalist say a little bit about what you see and it will be open to scrutiny by other iNaturalist users who will help to identify it for you as far as the picture will allow them okay so ultimately after you take your picture, this is basically what you see. If you've got an iPhone, this is how it works. So also, as you can see here, the date and the time is automatically logged, okay? The only thing that you really need to have a look at is the what did you see aspect up here. Click on this. iNaturalist will offer suggestions on what it is that you've taken a picture of. However, I absolutely discourage you from using this. Two main reasons for this. A, the original database, as it was um, firstly uh, created in California, will may offer you North American um, suggestions. Currently, the Asian database is getting a lot better. So uh, whatever it is that you might take a picture of, it will offer Asian um, suggestions. But actually, in the most part, it may offer you North American suggestions. Secondly, if you just say what you see, insect bird, plant, your observations will actually go on to um, other iNaturalist users who can identify it further down. The Android guys, I haven't left you out, all right? So basically, it's basically the same premise, but there is that little tick in the, in the top right-hand corner, which you can do to in order to share. This gives you an example of the type of thing that you will see. I took a picture of this spider in my bathroom a couple of years ago. Just for a little bit of context, I don't know if you can see it, my cursor here, but this little thing here is an eyelash. Okay, so it is a tiny, tiny spider, okay? Now I'm no ecologist, but I'm also not stupid. I know that that is a spider okay so therefore that is what i wrote so my handle my username for our naturalist is shellfish gene thank you it's a good one okay and i put in typed in spider and if you know you if you remember your taxonomy classes from school yes i'm sure you do 
Taxonomy is the science of classification of biodiversity. So it gave, when I typed in spider, it gave me the overarching term for spiders in taxonomy, which is class Eric Nieder. After sharing this, the wonderfully titled Robot Pi offered me a uh, offered an identification to this. He put, actually put it down to family level, which is family Carinidae. I'm guessing Castanero, but I'm not sure what genesis are found in Hong Kong. Thank you very much, Robot Pi. Following that, GC Snelling agreed with this. And then Ho Kun Wong, this, this guy's actually called Dixon Wong. Have you ever heard of Ho Kun Nature Education um, Astronomical Center? Amazing place, go see it. There's a plug for you, Dixon. Correctly identified this as Castanera Hong Kong in CIS. Zoology 123 agreed with this. Now, actually, I can click on this particular part and find out a little bit more about this particular species. So, A, my observation has been identified. B, I've engaged with other iNaturalist users. Think of iNaturalist as the social media of biodiversity monitoring. And C, my observation has been uploaded into a database. This shows you the amount of observations that have ever been taken in Hong Kong. I've isolated all of this. It counts for over 530,000 observation points of different um, species types. So you've got birds here, which amphibians, birds, fish, they're all in blue. Um, plants, obviously, in green mollusks, arachnids, and insects in orange, and others in different colors. So actually, what I can do, I'm just going to end my show a minute, stop my share. Oh, no, wrong one. Share something else. We'll see that. This is the actual database, the way, it's sound, the way it is right now. Okay, so if you log on to the website, this is what you see, basically, if you hit the explore function, which is up here. What I can do is I can filter this. So, I like spiders. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to isolate all the spiders that have ever been taken in Hong Kong. Here they all are. There are 419 different species of spider. Did you know that? Yeah. And I can click on them. Here they all are. Here's all the different species of spider here. So if I was a student, if I'm a teacher, I can use this database as a reference point for teaching ecology. If I'm a researcher myself, I don't want that first bit of baseline about where distribution of this particular species, I can look at this uh, database. Of course, there is an observational bias people only take a picture of what it is they want to take a picture of, okay? So, so this actually means the more charismatic species will have, uh, have their picture taken, but there are just under 1500 observations of this particular spider. I can click on this. This is the Nephila, you know, those giant spiders that you see in, um, in uh, what's it called? But you can actually see a little bit of history about when people actually have seen this particular spider. So you see this sort of observation part. A map of where these observations were taken, about a little bit of Wikipedia, not overly scientific, which is good. Taxonomy, stuff we all should have remembered from our biology classes at school. Status, there is no conservation status for this, and similar species that it has been mistaken for. Great thing also about iNaturalist, I can set up certain projects, collection projects, which will actually um, isolate certain things for me. For example, and probably relevant to you, there is a chap called John Terenzini. Have you heard of him? Okay, John basically has started this jellyfish project. Okay, and actually I helped set up an iNaturalist project for him. So any jellyfish that has been taken a picture of on iNaturalist will be isolated to this project automatically. Okay, so currently there's 298 observations of 33 species. This will always be under scrutiny, by the way. 
okay, people can still add identifications to this. So there may be something lower than 33 species, but, and of course, a lot of this, I think, have been taken in Ocean Park in some of the, you know, the tanks or whatever it is, I don't know. <laughs> But also closer to home, so this is the Pak Nai project, which obviously the Nature Conservancy are very, very interested in for their oyster reclamation project. So Pak Nai, this kind of shows you all of the observations that they've ever taken or that has ever been collected. Even if you've taken a picture here and you didn't know about this project, it would still be collected, okay? There was a moth one. I don't know if you guys know of Roger Kendrick. He's basically the mothman of Hong Kong. He has obviously collected about nearly 80,000 observations. I recently did an inter-school city nature challenge, which basically pitted about 40 schools against each other to log biodiversity in and around their, um, their uh, neighborhoods, their campus and their neighborhoods obviously trying to get them to be stewards of the biodiversity that's in and around their own um, schools. So to actually constantly monitor it. There it is for that. So the, the use and application of iNaturalist is not just a collection tool. You can actually use it in order to engage more people as well. So I'm just gonna stop that, move back into my presentation. Boom, all right. There it is. Hopefully that's okay for you at home. Our naturalist also is a bit, um, can actually pick up something really interesting as well. You've seen this before? Okay. This particular guy that was, um, had his picture taken about a couple of years ago in Sheko Country Park. It was on a railing that um, in, on, a, on one of those staircases going up on these parks itself. When he uploaded it onto iNaturalist, they, um, people were like, it's a spider, don't know what it is. Just a whole lot of no's were on his comment feed. About a month later, he actually found it again, luckily by the grace of God, captured it, which is illegal by the way, don't ever do that, you need an AFCD permit in order to do that type of stuff. Captured it, sent it to a friend of his in the University of Manchester, UK, and it did all sorts of little tests on it, DNA tests, physiological tests, et cetera, et cetera. Poor spider, I know, but this actually is new to science. Our naturalist played a big important role in this documentation. Sheko Country Park, ladies and gentlemen, okay? The name Uruballus Carlii was that um, the guy who actually saw this particular species noted that it is a caterpillar mimic. And so if you remember your school days, you would have heard of the Hungry Caterpillar books by Eric Carl. They named it Uruballus Carlii in honor of this particular author. I, I would love to imagine that because this is a jumping spider, by the way, it's about the same size as your fingertip. It basically um, is an ambush predator. So if anything likes to take a piece of this caterpillar looking spider, it can basically turn around and attack them back. Brilliant. Okay. So you never know what you're gonna find. City Nature Challenge. This is the last part of our um, talk at the moment. So the City Nature Challenge is an annual worldwide urban biodiversity competition. It is the largest synchronized a biodiversity monitoring event in the world. Okay, basically it was a competition, but at the present moment, COVID, it's more of a collaboration, that's how they want to market it, in which cities see who, they can, who can actually take the most observations, find the most species um, on iNaturalist itself. Currently there are 437 cities around the world which are in, involved in the City Nature Challenge. And all you have to do is between the 30th of April and the 3rd of May, take pictures on our naturalist. That's it. Obviously no pets, <laughs> all right? No indoor potted plants and definitely no selfies. <laughs> I will know, okay? There is a grace period of identification from the 4th to the 9th of May in which people can go back onto their observations and tidy them up as it were. Most people when they're out in the field take pictures and share it before actually offering a basic identification of 
insect, bird, or whatever it is, fish, all right? In the past, well, the, the, the origins of this CNC are basically the guys at California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco had a little bet with the guys in the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County about who can actually win this particular competition. As you can see, LA wiped the floor. San Francisco were livid, absolutely livid. So actually, but they did see the potential of how this could actually bring cities together in actually having this uh, synchronized event. Next year, 16, April 2018 was the first time it went international. That's when Hong Kong joined. Okay, basically I entered Hong Kong on a whim. I had absolutely no idea what I was doing, but basically I did it anyway. Next, uh, and of course from that, um, you know, more and more cities came, uh, got involved. So you can see from six years ago, two cities to now 437. It is bound to get larger and larger. Hong Kong shocked the world. Basically, we have consistently come into the top five for most species logged. Um, I've had a lot of city organizers contact me and say, Hong Kong, really? Isn't it just, you know, tall buildings, the harbor, shopping malls and stuff like that? And I'm like in that sweet, sweet stench of air pollution. No, we are not. OK, basically. The, um, the international perception is so, but here in Hong Kong, we know differently, okay? We have about 70% of our land mass is green, uh, green, uh, well, green, okay? Not to mention, of course, the marine and freshwater ecosystem that we have here, or the habitats that we have here. Now, this is a collaboration, as I said, so, oh, by the way, this map is basically the boundary. You take a picture anywhere in this map, so remember the dates logged, the locations logged, it will be collected into the CNC effort. WWF is the main coordinator for Hong Kong's effort, but this, as this is a collaboration, I've opened this up to certain partners, other NGOs, schools, community groups, you name it, um, hiking groups, Royal Yacht Club of Hong Kong, you know, um, in order to uh, actually gain some support for this, either through promoting or integrating it into your activities or even creating your own. Here are a few um, guys that have actually sort of said that they would do um, join in with such activities themselves. Obviously, there's you. Oh my God, there are you. Oh. Okay. That's basically it from me. Go out and explore, but bring your phone. Um, earlier when you were showing us your spider, yes. you mentioned something about a conservation status and the spider had no conservation status. So can you talk a little more about what that would have meant? Okay, so if, so in terms of what iNaturalist actually can do, if any observation is actually identified as, as something that is on the IUCN red list, the location will automatically be obscured within the 10 kilometer radius. This prevents things like um, poaching or makes it harder anyway, okay, to have a direct location. So even if you put, so actually, if you can very quickly, even if I go to say, what's those horrible squawking birds? Um, the cockatoo, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes, I am, yeah, ed education all the way, absolutely. Um, oh, sorry, oh, that's the location. So all of, so the cockatoo itself is critically endangered, right? So if I zoom in, you can see this big square sort of aspect. And of course, it's a very, it's not usual teardrop observation, it's a, it's a faded circle. So this shows that yes, there are three, um, you know, there are this, there is this cockatoo in Hong Kong, only one species that has no indication of how many there are, only the amount of observations of them, okay? So we all know that this particular cockatoo is in, 
you know, Hong Kong Park, right? That's where they all stand out, scaring the hell out of people with their, with their things. And if I actually zoom into Hong Kong Park, you will actually see that there are no observations directly linked to Hong Kong Park, okay? So if any, and of course, our naturalists themselves, if there is a particular species that is sensitive to an area, but is not on the red list, they will also be, they will also listen to these things. They don't want to be some, used as something you know, nefarious, anything like that. Okay, can we have more questions of Sean later? Because I think he might be able to assist us in what we're trying to do as well. Um, where is our PowerPoint? And do I speak into the speaker? Speaking into the computer. Yeah. Uh, just this way of introduction, as Megan's. Um, can you hear me on the on the Zoom? Yeah. Okay. Um, for those of us who've uh, been at the Yacht Club, particularly at Kellett Island, for quite a long time, like I have, uh, there's been a significant change in what's happened in the water and the environment around the Yacht Club. And if we go back um, sort of 20 years or more, um, the typhoon shelf was totally polluted and was um, the floating fat and everything all over. And um, it was actually uh, considered to be a dead, a dead environment. And uh, there was a situation at one time where it was going to be filled in uh, as part of the engineering works we're going to be carried out. Have you got that? Let's just keep going. We'll get the slides up in just yeah, a moment. Yeah. yeah. We can. We <laughs> can. <laughs> just a moment. I'll yeah. have to talk about it. <laughs> yes. So I, I think. Um, the, the government spent a lot of money on, on getting rid of the, um, the sewage from the harbor. And um, as a result of that, the water quality has improved significantly to we are back again to being able to do the cross harbor swim, which some of us have done. So um, this is um, the situation that we are looking at, which is particularly interesting to me personally, but. Um, I think it's interesting to anyone who's been around here for the last five or six years where we've had this incredible amount of uh, engineering work. And you can see this photograph shows that the, um, is there anything there? Yeah. that there's actually no water in here at all. So everything's been removed. And as a result of that, they were able to go down and construct the bypass underneath. And a similar, following that, there was a further uh, excavation along the seawall here, where it was taken down, as you can see there, that's the seawall's been removed and then rebuilt after the um, railway tunnel had been built underneath. So, so that's um, the situation it was. It finished about um, December last year, they did their last work. Um, this is again, a, another view of the same thing. And uh, again, they progressively moved this, this excavation across there. And this is the Wan Chai Basin. And um, this is the area where, again, this was basically all almost completely filled up and everything removed and then they excavated underneath it. Um, these, these are the areas which uh, at the end of last year will, were turned back into water. And, and for uh, us, it was interesting as to what is going to happen with nature now that it's been returned, right? So we set out a, a, a study area boundary, which is this one here. And uh, we identified four areas where we thought was, uh, would be relevant to, to do our, our basic research. And um, this is inside the Typhoon Shelter, so is this one. This is in the bay at the front. And this part of the island, because it, it, it is Kellett Island, was an island. Um, this is the only bit of natural shoreline left in the central harbour. And, uh, and this portion has never been um, interfered with by engineering works for a very long time. And, and the two uh, walls that are there um, have been in existence for a long time. So this is sort of a historical part that hasn't been affected, whereas you have the other parts that have been. So um, what we did is we... Um, we thought we'd do an ecology study and we thought we had a very good opportunity to track what was happening with the water and the life and marine life within the water from the time of 
total disturbance and progressive recovery. So we applied to uh, ECF, the um, EPD funding uh, branch, uh, to get us get some, some money to do a two-year study so we could monitor to this, including employment of people who could actually do it uh, as, as in a professional way. It was a combination of the, uh, the professions and the, um, and the citizen, and we failed, right? Which is the next one. We didn't get any funding. And, and this is, um, this is a ref to me, it's a community reflection of what is the harbor is. And this is what we were trying to prove that the harbor is not what it was, that things have changed significantly. Our funding was rejected because it was considered that there was no ecological interest in the area we wanted to study. And it was basically a dead ecological area, which it had been. And there was no reason to carry out a study for two years because there was nothing of ecological interest that was going to take place. So we didn't take that sitting down. <laughs> so we, we set out, first of all, we did um, a water quality test because we were all doubtful about the quality of the water in the Tycoon shelter and the uh, one Chai Basin in particular. And our study showed that the water quality was really good. The E. coli counts were very low, it was swimmable, and the visibility was at three or four meters. And it was just, you know, the turbidity is very low. So this was a really good opportunity to say to our diver and her friend that uh, it's okay, you can go down there and you're not going to come out with things growing all over you or anything yeah, like I, that. I had to see the test results. Yeah. Because, uh... <laughs> she, she would not go in beforehand. This and so, so we did. And iNaturalist has actually been a bit of a uh, prompt to do this actual dive that we did last weekend. And I don't dive, I just snorkel. But it was absolutely brilliant what happened. And I now pass over to, to our diver. Hey, thank you, Ian. Thank you for the nice introduction. Um, so I'm Megan Schmaltry. Um, I'm a member of the Sustainability Working Group here at the club. And I'm also an avid diver, um, as Ian mentioned. So we participated in the SWG town hall just a couple of weeks ago. And during that town hall, we essentially promised that we were going to do these pilot dives on the 11th of April. So the three sort of next steps that we laid out before you during that town hall have now come along uh, the next step. And now we're going to share the results and share what we might consider our next steps and look to get some more support uh, to take our studies further. So what did we do? On the Sunday 11th of April, we conducted two dives, one dive in the Wan Chai Basin, which featured in the photos that Ian was showing in the introduction. And we also did a dive in the Typhoon Shelter, uh, which is, I'll show you on the map, these two areas. So the first here in the Wan Chai Basin, we did about a 45 minute, seven meter max depth dive in the Wan Chai Basin. Our intention was to traverse all the way along this wall, uh, cross the basin and then also observe what we could find over here. Um, just to give you an idea, we ended up spending a lot more time on this wall than we thought we were going to, simply because of the volume and the, the differentiation in features that we found on the wall. So we'll get more to that shortly. Uh, the second dive that we did, we dove the typhoon shelter on the inside of the wall, so very close to where a lot of our big boats live. Uh, we did a 35 minute dive there with a max depth of about four meters, so a bit more shallow. Um, and very important, um, I think, to share with you uh, was the safety element. So I kind of glossed over this earlier, but anytime you're diving in an area which has traffic of boats, there's a lot of things that you need to take into account. So just to give you guys an idea of what kind of safety measures we set up, we had cherry boys set up that were cordoning off the area in order to keep ourselves safe. We also had a responsible shore person who was on shore at all times and liaising with us directly uh, in between dives, before dives, after dives, and he knew where we were. We also had two responsible non-divers aboard the vessel that we were diving from, and we had very strict time limits and we made sure we did not dive outside of the visual range of our responsible boat persons at any time. So just to highlight there, we had very strict safety involved Anytime you're diving, let alone in an area where you might be having boat traffic or sampan traffic, you need to take diving safety extremely seriously. Okay. So important to note that. 
Um, and moving along, so the topic of this part of the evening is what creatures did they find, right? And I think that's what we'd all like to get to, right? So when we descended into the wall of the Wan Chai Basin for the very first time, um, maybe I can get rid of that for you guys, okay? Uh, we weren't sure what we were going to see, um, but one of the things that became immediately evident was there were a lot of anemones. Okay, so anemones are nadarians and they share the same genus or family as coral. So when we found these anemones, we thought, okay, this is quite promising. I mean, we didn't expect to see the volume that we found. Uh, to give you an idea of what the wall looks like, when you descend and you're doing a wall dive, sometimes this is what you see. And you're like, wow, algae, green, brown stuff, right? But then you take a closer look and you start to realize, wait a minute, there is a lot going on here. In this case, I've just circled anemones. There are many different pale anemones. I know they're pale anemones because the citizen scientists on iNaturalist have helped me to identify them. Um, and then you look a bit further and you start to notice, oh wait, there's bivalves, there are some sponges, there's a sea squirt. You start to notice a lot of things, right? So just to give you an idea of what diving the seawall of the Wan Chai Basin is, this is sort of how it starts. And then you start to zoom in. So here's a couple of different photographs of the pale anemones up close that we found in the Wan Chai Basin. Um, my dive partner for these dives, Valerie Dodge, uh, I, I know because I've dove with her many times that she has a great affinity for anemones. So as soon as I saw these, I was like, you know, that's it. You know, we're gonna have uh, 2000 anemone pictures and nothing else. Um, but of course that wasn't true. Uh, we did find a lot more anemones in the typhoon shelter. In fact, many of the rocks and the features of the typhoon shelter are simply blanketed in uh, these anemones. So. Um, definitely worth noting, there's a lot of anemones in both of these areas, so if you ever end up in the typhoon shelter for any reason, I hope you don't, uh, unless you're going to dive or look for nature, uh, watch out for anemones, okay, because they do sting. And they're also um, an enemy of coral. Uh, um, it's, it's difficult for coral to grow in environments that have a lot of anemones growing on them. They sting, they irritate the coral. Um, so that's a, an important thing to keep in mind when I get towards the end of the presentation of our findings. Okay. All right, so what else did we find? Uh, the second thing that became apparent very quickly was that there were a lot of sponges uh, growing all over the area. Um, sponges are a very simple uh, creature. Um, they can be one of a couple different kinds. There's encrusting sponges, which are primarily made of calcium, uh, which you can see here on the left side of the screen. And there's also sponges which take a more tubular form and we therefore call them tubular sponges. So we noticed a lot of these in the Wan Chai Basin. Uh, you can see also a, a baby anemone hanging out here next to the sponge. Uh, and then you can also see, I guess, a, a bit of a clue as to what else we found very abundant in both the Wan Chai Basin and in the Typhoon Shelter. Okay, And both these sponges, uh, they grow in little groups. The one on the right was about the size of maybe my hand sticking out of the wall, whereas the more calciferous sponge uh, was also about hand shaped or, or maybe the size of a couple of fingers. So they're not huge. Um, these, these photos are definitely zoomed in, but we found a lot of them. The typhoon shelter had a lot of sponges as well, um, mostly I believe the orange golf ball type of sponge. So these are popular. We see them in Saikong when we dive, um, but I hadn't expected to see such colorful uh, sponges, such colorful creatures as well, growing right inside our typhoon shelter. So I thought, okay, sponges, I understand. I'm not extremely surprised by sponges. They're very robust. Okay. Uh, the third most abundant creature that we found were our crustaceans, our crabs. Uh, we found a lot of crabs. When we were traversing the Wan Chai Basin, when we were diving along the wall, every crevasse or every crack that we peered into in the wall, there was almost always a crab just peering back at us. Um, so there's a lot of crabs down there, um, and we found many of them, not just these red crabs, but also some small hermit crabs and other species. Um, there were a few different kinds. Uh, the typhoon shelter was also hosting a, a few crabs. Um, these crabs are not hugging. This is actually a crab eating a crab. So we watched that for a while. We were quite distracted watching some real National Geographic stuff take place. So we observed and then we moved on. Uh, and we needed to move on because there were a lot of fish that we also wanted to document, um, both in the typhoon shelter and also in the Wan Chai Basin, um, and different types of fish inhabiting both sites. 
So in the Wan Chai Basin, we found a type of male-cheeked fish. Uh, male-cheeked fishes include lionfish, scorpion fish. We haven't ID'd what type of male-cheeked fish this is yet. Uh, we hope to. I think it's a red scorpion fish that's just doing a really good job of camouflaging itself in the Wan Chai Basin. Um, but perhaps uh, it could be something else. So we're working on that. Uh, the guy on the right is definitely a striped catfish. Um, we often see these in large schools up in Saikong, uh, but we have this guy and we did see a couple others um, hanging out here in the Wan Chai Basin as well. In the Typhoon shell, oh, sorry, in the Wan Chai Basin, there was also uh, a character that we, we found many times. This is a type of uh, a bunny, um, I, or I believe a type of goby. Um, but we found a lot of him both in the Wan Chai Basin and in the Typhoon Shelter. So um, very uh, different types of fish found in the Wan Chai Basin. In the Typhoon Shelter, I think we saw uh, what might not surprise us because we often see these guys from the pontoons themselves when we're getting ready to sail the boats or when we're getting ready to go rowing. There's a lot of small, often juvenile fish who shul near the, or near the pontoons. I think especially in recent years, I think we've seen a lot of them, uh, which is of course a sign of perhaps healthier conditions. I, I won't make any sweeping statements, but we've seen a lot of them lately. Uh, so we found quite a few different shoals of what I believe are dart fish uh, in the typhoon shelter. And there were other types of fish as well. I, I believe these guys, which they're a little bit difficult to see, apologies for that. So there was a lot going on under the water. I believe they're a type of butterfly fish. And we found many of these small silvery fishes. I'm not sure if they're juvenile fish or if this is actually just life for them. And they say this small forever, but they were certainly appreciating all of the good stuff that we were kicking up as we were diving. And they were hanging out with us for most of the dive, I think eating some of the things that we were kicking up around them. There were a lot of fish in the typhoon shelter as well. Um, the fifth most abundant creature that we found was the mollusk. A mollusk is quite a broad category of simple organism. A mollusks includes um, things like sea slugs, but also includes creatures like clams, um, bivalves, well, clams are bivalves, but it's quite a broad category of creature. So what you see here, in fact, is not a mollusk or not a sea slug itself, but this is very evident that sea slugs have been here and they live here and they've been breeding here because these are sea slug eggs. Um, nudibranch, perhaps, uh, the sea slugs lay their eggs in a, a little ribbonous formation, which is always nice to see. So you can imagine when I saw this, I spent a lot of time trying to find whoever was responsible. Uh, and I did not, unfortunately, I did not find it, but the evidence is here. Someone made this, so we know that there are nudibranch or some other type of um, sea slug in the Wan Chai Basin. Um, so we continued to look, and when we were doing our transverse, attempting to make it across to the other side before Valerie got a bit cold and gave me the, like, can we go up? I'm like, oh, okay. Um, we did manage to find this. So this uh, lovely kind of ornate creature is a ragged sea hare. We often see these in Saikang. And in fact, recently they've been forming large mating balls and congregating in quite, uh, quite large groups in Saikang. But I have to say, I was very surprised. I did not expect to see one moving along the large layer of silt, which has accumulated at the bottom of the Wan Chai Basin. So we did find this lovely fellow um, just doing his best <laughs> to be in the Wan Chai Basin. Um, I did check and sea slug eggs look a bit more like, a, I'm American, so we had a, like crazy cheese when we were growing up, like the orange cheese that's like liquid that comes out. That's what's uh, lovely, delicious, right? <laughs> <laughs> the Europeans are like, oh my god. Um, but anyway, that, that's what uh, sea hair eggs look like. So I do not think that these belong to uh, this person. But, you know, um, like I said, someone made them. So they're there. Uh, we also found various types of clams. I proposed to iNaturalist that this was a giant clam and someone didn't like that. They chucked me back over to bivalves in general. And I said, okay, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to the more advanced citizen scientists, I suppose, to help me figure out what this is. So that's still in progress. Um, but there are clams and there are other types of bivalves that we found all over the Wan Chai Basin. 
Um, we found some in the typhoon shelter too, but uh, when I was looking at the photos, I, I couldn't find any of particularly good enough quality to share with you guys tonight. I think that once we get everything uploaded, then perhaps we can share more broadly everything that we found. Okay. Um, and I think this might be one of the things that I'm the most excited about because I think it, it raises a lot of questions and kind of asks, you know, what should we do about all this? Um, but the other category of creature that we found in the harbor was actually coral. So it wasn't a coronation coral. It wasn't, you know, the, the beautiful purple and green or orange. It wasn't that kind of coral, um, but indeed it, it was coral. So this coral, um, and please forgive the photo quality, this was my camera. This was not Valerie's super impressive rig. <laughs> uh, this was my camera. Um, I found either a living or perhaps maybe, I'm not sure how healthy it is, but I did find coral in the Wan Chai Basin. Um, when I zoom in on this photo, it looks like I can see tentacles. So it looks like the coral is alive and perhaps it was feeding. Um, but it's a bit difficult to tell. Um, but either way, this coral, I may pronounce it incorrectly, is Ulastria crispata. It's a type of encrusting coral which grows on rock surfaces. Um, but essentially, like most coral, it needs rock in order to grow or some kind of surface that it can attach to and start to, um, I guess, draw minerals and start to create its body or its skeleton. Uh, so we did find this in the Wan Chai Basin. And perhaps a better um, photo, we found the same species, as I understand it to be, Elastria crispata or zebra coral. We found the same thing in the typhoon shelter. Um, in fact, it probably would have been good to do a bit more of a pre-dive briefing rather than just photograph everything, which is what we did. Perhaps we should have specified, you know, if we do find coral, it's very special. Because later on when we were looking at the photos, Valerie said, oh, I saw it everywhere. I'm like, well, why didn't you take pictures of it? <laughs> um, well, you know, you said that people wanted fish. <laughs> and so like, of course we got the fish, of course we got everything. Um, but I do feel that this is very special. And I think that this sort of asks a few questions. You know, if coral is there and coral is living, mind you, this is a very robust type of coral. I was trying to do some research after we found it. And I see there's been many studies about this specific type of coral in Hong Kong and how robust it is and how many different challenging environments it's been in. In fact, there was a study that was done analyzing the different challenging environments that the zebra coral was living in. And it included, it included uh, Crescent Island, Bluff and Lantau but no one thought to check the harbor <laughs> and I don't blame them. Um, but perhaps what we see here is evidence that maybe the harbor is not uh, the extreme environment or extremely hostile environment that we may have thought it was, right? So what we've done is, you know, we've completed our pilot dive. We've shared the results with you. And through doing this, we are continuing to gather support so that we can take this further. Um, I think, you know, once we find uh, coral in the harbor, there's a lot of benefits that we talk about when we consider doing a marine, a marine ecology study at Kellett. You know, there's stewardship of the area, awareness of marine life, and all of this is well in accordance with our clean regattas principles, which um, Sheila and others have been working very hard to promote throughout the club, and we're getting better. Um, however, you know, we found coral in the harbor, and we need to sort of figure out what can we do about that? Can we help? Um, and we certainly invite ideas from yourselves or from any experts or advisors you may know. Um, I think we should do something. Um, I, I was just snorkeling around and um, these guys were down around four meters or, or so, and I could see them down there. And, and, and <laughs> As Megan mentioned, they didn't get anywhere. We thought there was a problem because they didn't move from that wall, that a 20 meter strip of the wall, they were there for 25 minutes and they're supposed to go across and on the other side. And this is, you can see that this is in about a year since that wall was actually turned back to being available for nature to come back. And for the, 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 the bed of the Wan Chai Basin, they were required to come back and um, remove some of the soil on the bottom to deepen it to about um, six meters, depending on the tide. And th there's a layer of silt about that deep still on the bottom. And, and when we were talking to the University of, of Hong Kong guys uh, originally, 
one of them was really interested to see what was happening, would be happening on the bottom, because that was the last disturbed area with nothing growing on it. And um, for her to find that beautiful creature there was absolutely amazing. But anyway, um, the, there's a bit more to uh, biodiversity than diving, right? So for some of us who don't spend time under the water, um, we, we also um, we're, we're working with the um, Hong Kong Bird Watching Society and we got them to come in and they did a one hour um, transit through our site and they found, um, found a whole series of birds. And, and some of them are really um, quite, um, well, I think they're fantastic. I think that's a simple word. Um, specific, specifically the egrets and the herons that are here. And, and so you have a relationship with the water and the bird life. And um, the biggest um, uh, egret tree uh, roosting spot is, was at the far end of the, hub, uh, of the typhoon shelter where the fire station is. And there were something like 80 birds used to roost there. And then uh, with the construction of the access road into the, the bypass, a large proportion of those trees have gone. And um, when I last looked, there were about six birds there. So um, that's something, you know, again, we have like, this is Denny's photograph on the right hand side. He said it's a whole family of egrets taken from the bistro, right? But these, we're trying to do it in a systematic scientific way. And we want to be able to record things progressively. And we want to make the information available for other people to be able to handle it. And um, that, that's part, part of the thing. And, and we, we have experts within um, the club um, who, who can lead this along. But at the same time, we don't have a good system for recording the information that we're getting. And this is where I wonder if iNaturalists can actually become our record based, like we've set up a Colored Island project on iNaturalist. So if anyone takes a photograph within this general area, uh, it will be recorded as the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club Colored Island project. And um, we would like to do it systematically. We'd like to be able to do the same transit sex that we've done. Uh, we really would like to do the bit in the front, which is the uh, the oldest bit of the harbour and to see what there, it's about uh, down to about 13 metres in depth there. So it drops away quite quickly from the old island. And then obviously um, we're, we're all um, dumbstruck with the amount of stuff that is down there and living there. And, and to see this and if we can go back, somehow or rather we have to go back and do it so that the, there's a, a wider knowledge of what's happening in the harbour because all of us have been able to see the fish around the pontoons and so on, but there are fish that are jumping. There are all sorts of other things out there which indicate that the harbor's coming back. And one of the things that we were thinking about, there's a really good story about how Victoria Harbor has regenerated in the last four to five years. And if we can um, monitor that over two years in a systematic way, present the evidence and the, and the information and encourage other people to do studies as well, then we're going to be able to put together a really good um, scientifically based citizen study of the, of the place. I don't know if you have anything that you'd want to contribute before we open it right up. Um, I think it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, if there's any questions or answers, you know, get it. We, we like uh, to encourage cross discussion um, and, and then, then any indication of what we could do next, because one of the things is that we could do one more um, dive if there are people interested in it in the front of the area during the period of the intercity competition um, on the first, I think, is it Sunday the first? Uh, Sunday the second. But second. Yes, yeah. we, maybe we'll find some urchins for yeah. fresh <laughs> Or some more corals. Yeah. But anyway, open to the floor. We need to put some microphone. Um, so in the basin, we were about six meters, and in the typhoon shelter, we were only at about four meters. Um, this particular type of coral, I understand, is, is quite happy to live in shallower waters with a lot of sunlight, um, and it can handle the temperature fluctuations that that brings. So. Was there much sunlight? 
In the typhoon shelter, yes, 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 it was fairly sunny, especially in the typhoon shelter. Um, and I guess for those of you who do um, brave diving in Hong Kong, uh, April this time of year is usually the best visibility that we get. Cold water usually means clear water for us in Hong Kong. So um, this yeah. is potentially the right time to do it if you've never tried diving in Hong Kong before. <laughs> I mean, just in snorkeling around in the typhoon shelter, I could see down to about three and a half, four meters. And you, you know, like she mentioned, that, that where the rocks, the blocks are put there, there's a gap, and right. every gap has something in it. There are a lot of really pretty um, clownfish over there. You know, it was like Saving Nemo over there. They were everywhere, but they never saw them. They were on the wrong wall. You know? But yeah, so even in the top three meters, you could see very, very clearly. Yeah. What's deep? The deepest, the deepest for this dive. Um, we were at seven meters in the Wan Chai Basin. I double check my one, uh, my watch to get this. Yes, yes. I mean, my, my dive buddy stuck her measuring stick or her buoyancy stick uh, into the silt, and that sticks about yay long. So I mean, that silt it went all the way up to the top of her buoyancy stick. So um, it's quite a lot there. We don't know how deep it was, and we weren't going to <laughs> find out. <laughs> Great question. Is there anyone on Zoom has got any questions? Or would like to comment or make a contribution? Uh, Sam Cook, you'd like to dive with us? That's great. <laughs> we'll hire you. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, given like the pollution at area of the harbor, do you think it has a quite a first effect on populations of species of things producing to reduce what the trap on the billion fish but in terms of like the, the, the pollution the gasoline effect of those it's a very interesting conversation right because we know there's petrol that's going into the sea i mean you see the sand pans you hear it you smell it it's there so i mean anything that is surviving in this challenging environment you have to expect is quite robust um, but this is some of the, these are some of the topics I'd like to explore with experts uh, yeah. because, you know, we're, we're divers and we love the sea and we're sailors and we love the sea, uh, but we don't have a lot of that knowledge. Yeah. Um, you know, there, like I mentioned, there was a study that was done on the robust nature of the species of coral that we found. Uh, they didn't think to try the harbor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think there's really something to your question. Yeah, you think it'd be barren if you like, go away some well Exactly, yeah. yeah. I think it's really interesting because about three months ago, there was a presentation on, um, on, on fish that had been identified throughout Hong Kong. And we asked about, have they done any surveys in the harbor? There was no history of any survey in the harbor on any of this. So to me, this was quite mind breaking that we can actually be able to identify, particularly the corals. The corals, are, there used to be corals on the old star ferry piers, but um, that's, that's something which, um, if we are going to be stewards of, the, of this area around us, what do we do? And the, one of the big questions that um, people have put to us already is, what can we do to encourage corals and other things to come back into our harbor? How can we help uh, manage it in a way that would be suitable? And, you know, the, the oil, there's, oh, there? it's okay. there's more oil in the typhoon shelter than there was over here. And, Honestly, um, you know, I've swum in the harbor races and things like that. And this was the sweetest water that we've swum, that I've ever swum in the harbor. It was absolutely pure. It felt really good after when we came out, didn't we? Well, I haven't grown the third arm that some of my friends have suggested. <laughs> None of us were sick. So <laughs> the question about the pollution, um, the water, yeah, I think we need to man, um, measure the water on a more regular basis. What is the quality of the water? Does it change? Um, the lady on the typhoon uh, on the uh, sampan said that when it rains, uh, it can get very black over here because mm. of what's washed down from the uh, the hinterland. You know, so um, yeah. it's obviously going to change from time to time. But um, we were absolutely astounded to find the water quality was so good when we did the water quality test. You know? um, yes, and sorry. oh, I was just going to say um, when it comes to encouraging growth of features like coral, and they don't grow in silt. Right, and they don't grow in areas that are completely covered by anemones, like some of the areas that we saw. Um, so you know that that raises the question: Is there something that we could do, some kind of like 
you know, dare I say, like even an artificial reef or something that we could do to help them grow because uh, they're there, you know, coral arrived and, and it grew yeah. there. So or well, are they growing out here in the front? You know? okay. Very well, could be, maybe yeah. some different kinds. Sorry, but, um, yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> Simple answer. I, I mean, it's not that, that, that it wouldn't be really interesting to do. Just haven't got around to it yet. To, to, uh, to me, the, the most the thing that people don't know about is what's happening in the harbor and what's happened since all the engineering work's finished. I expect yeah, we'd sorry. find some really yeah. nice stuff. The lady behind. Yes. I mean, I was going to just mention, I think they have choices, but that's what they're being. Should the person because they are racist? Oh, sorry. Yeah. That's a great question. I guess I'll take your first point first. Uh, we do have a brand of reef safe sunscreen that is on offer in the ship shop. I think it's called Bare Minerals. We did a post on it. To your point, there's also uh, brands that do contain unsafe for reef chemicals as well. So I guess, I guess, unfortunately, that's a point of consumer education. Um, but it's a good point. Um, the second one on why we don't monitor water quality. I mean. I don't know, it's something that we'd like to do as part of this kind of study. Um, it's something that we discussed incorporating into our original two year uh, plan that we tried to get EPD funding for um, that was rejected. Um, but that would be a, a fantastic supplementation to yeah. doing the, the, bio, the biodiversity piece as well. So I definitely. Think, so I think you can get testing kits, which would be very simple to procure, I think. Uh, very basic ones. Binaturalists, obviously, um, only goes so much as that it gives an understanding of the distribution of species. It does not give any uh, understanding of uh, abundance or any, even in this case, resilience of species. Now, what that obviously is a further deeper study. But if you, you know, citizen science, the main basis of citizen science is with data collection. Hopefully, in the future, there will be um, citizen science which incorporates data analysis as well. And from that, informed policy decisions, you know, which is the goal of what we can do. Um, but ultimately, doing the understanding of why species are actually there would be the, the natural sort of um, next sure, step for, yeah. under, you know, for seeing what is there with no prejudging, you know, with no prejudice, as it were, this is what we have found. And then following on that to why is this here? Water quality would be a fantastic parameter to add to that. Weather as well, um, you know, turbidity, all that type of stuff will be a fantastic way. And then you can try obviously find out correlations, great hypotheses, get your um, a basis in to get like yeah. PhD guys involved. In yes, yeah. I was yeah. noticing yeah. these comments. Yeah. yeah, we, you know, we, we would love to have some guys who are doing PhDs or even doing some university level study to come in yes. and, and, and take a group of us and, and set us in a, in a direction where we know what we're going to do with the information we've collected. Because you've got how many slides, photographs? Uh, oh, we took about, well, we took probably over 400 between the two of us. Yeah, and there were about 80 or so that uh, you have since sort of taken away. Um, oh, unique 200. photos? We yeah. had about 180 what I would consider unique captures, um, which clearly shows different individuals. Um, I've just started to analyze the photos and th there's a lot to get through, so I, yeah. I could definitely use some help. Um, but yes, so about 180 unique photos of individuals and different species identified. Yeah. Um, the, the other comment regarding transects along the seawall, we would like to set up a pattern 
of where we, ex we, we do the transects and the areas which are most suitable. I think there are probably at least three places, probably more that we could do them. And the two most productive ones are probably the ones that we haven't done. Uh, the wall along the, um, the end of the typhoon shelter, uh, of the, sorry, one Chai Basin, the eastern wall is, is a very different wall to the rest. It's been like that for hundred, almost hundreds of years a hundred years or more. And then the transect, a transect around the front, um, either dropping down deep, I don't know which way they want to go, or, or coming around. Um, it would be potentially very productive. But the point is, um, we'd need to, to see, to monitor change. We need to have a systematic way of doing it. And that's yeah. where we need the scientists who are doing their PhD and Got a lot of spare yes, come time. Come do your thesis. Yeah. yeah, and <laughs> the, if anyone wants to do a study, a specific study on something <laughs> in, in, in Caledon, we'd love to have that too. Yeah. Um, I think you've been trying to ask a question for, for a moment. Did you have a point? or? Uh, yeah, just two things. Uh, can we perhaps organize a snorkeling day? A snorkeling day? If you say you can see things as a snorkeler. Yeah. And then we can all do it together. And... Yeah. Sure, I think that's something. And second point is, will you be writing to EPD and for information only? <laughs> no, I mean, we, we, there's an application to be made um, to EPD for funding twice a year. And um, we, we wanted to set up a proper system where everything was going online and all the rest of it so that people could use it, it could be very user friendly. Um, we applied for 1.1 million for two years, which wasn't too bad. And considering it was having a person employed to do that, plus to do the community engagement part as well. Um, they didn't believe that there was anything there. We've now got proof, right? <laughs> and and I think if we went back with this, it would be uh, it would blow their minds. Yeah. I hope. I think and, that was your question, right? Yeah. Like, have we let them know? Yeah. FYI, we've had, okay. We're trying to decide if we're not petty. Yeah. No, <laughs> just kidding. I'm not but, not petty. But this, also, but also the maritime maritime museum has set up a uh, what ecology oh, yeah. unit, yes. marine yeah. ecology. Yeah. Unit. Yeah. Yeah, and, and if we can we can collaborate with them and maybe WWF to say you know so we get other <laughs> get other people uh, to help us with the community side of it as well. Yeah. Like if we there's a bit of a, a question around why is the yacht, why is the Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club applying for money from government, right? But they don't realize we're a members club and all the rest of it. But um, you know I think we should try again. And then we should try and expand it. We should set up a systematic process that can go on. Like I'd, I'd love to just have, um, we, we went out and checked the uh, water quality. We did it, it took about an hour. Um, even just to have kids come out and go out with the people that are doing it, just to explain to them what they're doing and then to see the results afterwards. And if we could do that every month, um, if we could get the bird watching society to come in, say four times a year and, and take, um, members and, and maybe some of the community from outside and take them around and explain two things. Explain how to look at a bird. <laughs> I, I, it's unbelievable when you listen to some of these people, they can see things that are, you know, we, we don't, would never even imagine are there. And then they can quantify them and all the rest of it. And some of them actually know them by first name terms, I'm sure. That, that's Fred over there. And, uh, yeah. But um, I don't know if WWF and uh, I know there's some things are going to be coming down here to look at in relation to the uh, the plastic um, pick up plastic uh, program that, that is operating from here too. Um, and just for for um, the folks commenting on the chat, um, Sam Cook, we see you, and we see you have some friends doing their PhD in coral reef growth, which is amazing. Please, let's find a way to connect and talk about uh, ways we could potentially get your friends involved. Yeah. Um, George Lee, we hear you as well. Thanks so much. Um, agree, there's a lot of enthusiasm and the key indeed is to turn it into something meaningful and into some meaningful next steps for a project. I completely agree. Um, and Tia, sure, we'll send you an email. Okay, we certainly will. there is a, an email at sustainability at rhkyc. Yeah, it's sustainability yeah. at rhkyc.org.hk. Yeah. So, so that, that will come to Denny, I think, and then we will be able to follow on to it. Yes. Um, can we get rid of that uh, box for a moment? 
So, you know, we're, we've always got uh, something coming up. Um, the sustainability working group uh, comes up with all sorts of ideas, but we don't present ourselves very well. And one of the things that came out of the uh, town hall was that people didn't know about the things that we were doing. Like the best one was the, the people taking part in clean regattas didn't even know they were taking part in the clean regatta program, right? And, um, and then, you know, the uh, sustainability uh, don't bring plastic, uh, single use plastic to the club and so on. So we would like to have a t shirt design competition where the people who are within the club and have the ability to design and simplify things and present them in a way that tells the main message and is also something that they'd really like to wear and just you know, advertise to the public elsewhere that we're doing things along these lines. So for May, we have um, the first of our three themes. One is, is the general principle. What, what is the club's responsibility towards sustainability? And if you go on the website, um, you'll see there's a whole lot of really boring words, but they're actually quite good. But if you could just, someone could come up and encapsulate that in a really good design, that would be fantastic. We'd, uh, we'd, we'd run off a series of t-shirts. Um, obviously, we were really proud of our preventing plastic, single-use plastics into the club, but then people keep forgetting about it all the time. And then they're, they're bringing in, the, we go through sort of cycles of less and more plastic coming in. And then the clean regattas, this is a really good one to look at. It's, a, it's something that the club's applying to all of our regattas, sailing, rowing, and paddling. And as a result of that, there's a systematic approach that we do, um, Sheila's led most of it, where we go through uh, a, a checklist of what should happen at, at, in, in one of these regattas. And if someone could come up with a really good design, which encapsulated the main themes of that, then we will, we will print them, um, they'll get a, uh, a, a, a sponsored meal in the, in the compass room and their name on the T-shirt as the designer, right? So please, uh, anyone who's got any interest in this, by the end of May, we want to have a whole series of really neat T-shirt designs, uh, something better than the club's ever had before. We'd like to have a whole sustainability series, uh, including we could have some relating to ecology in the next round, but we'll keep it to these three to start with. So if you want to contact us on anything, sustainability is more than from your club up there. That's the email address to use. Uh, Denny is the sustainability manager in the club. Uh, if you ring and ask for Denny Lee, this is the man who'll be there, right? And we really would like any um, ideas, any initiatives. Um, and would there be any interest in um, yeah, like, if you want to take uh, underwater photography, right, you've got to have the right camera, right? So that's true. We we did bring all of our own equipment. Yeah. Um, the, the, so we um, we could have another guy on that day because it would everything would count international in the international competition if it was done on the second. And um, <laughs> if there's enough people interest, it doesn't have to be a lot of people, right? Yeah. Sounds like Sam Cook's interested. I know that we have a couple of dive instructors in our club who are interested. Um, so if you're interested, she's yeah. interested. Would it, yeah. Are we all divers? Like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. And, and, and we, Mark and I can go snorkeling. Right? <laughs> yeah, please contact us because now we, we've kind of set a precedent. We know how to dive here. We know how to do it safely. Um, obviously, there's some coordination with the sailing office and with the rowing office. The rowing on <laughs> uh, that Ian's the representative of. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so we, we kind of do that first just to make sure that, you know, when we look at the slack tides, which you want to dive at slack tide um, for safety reasons, um, you kind of might, you might check and just make sure are there any, is there going to be a lot of traffic in the area of like class boats that are going out for a race or rowers that are in the area as yeah. well. Like those are the kind of things that you check. And so there's a bit of coordination that goes behind diving in the waters, but um, well, now we also know it's, it's worth it. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we're sorry, way we over. Also have sorry. a collection project in order to which will, which will uh, consolidate all of your observations birds, coral, crabs, whatever it is. If it's actually in this particular <coughs> area, it will be collected. Yep. So, a quick question. So, I'm Andrea from Hong Kong Shark Foundation, oh. yeah. and we are a um, Royal Hong Kong Yacht Club charity. Yeah. 
Um, and so we would definitely support you guys. This is a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. This is actually something we talked about years ago. But oh, thank you. <laughs> unfortunately, we couldn't do it because it was raw sewage flooding into the <laughs> area. Which one of my questions was, is when did the raw sewage stop flowing into the harbor there? Was that 2020? Yeah. Um, so the year, so it was April 2020? Or was that 2019? I think it's three or four years ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, I was gonna say. That was when they, they did the, the last yes. cutoff, and that's when they started the cross harbor swim again. That's so that's saying. about the time. And and what what the, the what was happening was that the the center of the harbor was improving, but the embayed areas wasn't. And that's why we were concerned about what was happening in these embayed areas. And, and fortunately it was uh, really, really good. Sorry. <coughs> is it illegal for boats to dump sewage in the water? I, I know it's illegal in the US because um, even cruisers have to have holding tanks, but I, I actually don't think it's illegal in Hong Kong. But don't quote me, I'm not sure. I'm not like a, well, I don't work for <laughs> I'm sure you could Google it and find out. I think that might yeah, be a Googleable sure question. The marine yeah. You don't say that to make sure. Sure. So in regards to the clean regatta, um, actually Doug Woodring here from Ocean Recovery Alliance, yeah. you know, he's got an initiative going with recycled bags to pick up rubbish in the harbor and put it in. Sorry. Um, Doug, Doug and you, I think, and Pat Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the, the yacht club, uh, we have a, a plastic, this is the next thing as well after yeah. this, right? Yeah. It's a pick up plastic and the idea pick is that plastic. because we are on the water, yeah. And we're, we're, we are in a situation where we can pick up plastic that other people can't. They can pick yeah. it up on the beach, pick it up on the land. But if you're out in the water and you see the plastic and it's bad, uh, the, we've got the bags on that, that Doug's just provided to us. So yes. we're jointly doing it. Yeah. And those bags will be in all the boats. And yeah. the people are there, they pick up the plastic, put it in it's the bag. It's fantastic. It's great. So, and you know, then we bring it back. Yeah. Ocean Rec Sorry, Doug had to leave. But yeah. Ocean Recovery Alliance and Hong Kong Shark Foundation do a lot together and we absolutely support if you need our help on that it's great and i work with andy cornish from wwf yeah. you know unfortunately of all those things you saw in there there's no sharks which <laughs> we don't have a very good ecosystem right and but um you know maybe in the future right that would be amazing <laughs> that, that would be great right yeah, yeah. we had so, a great part of dolphins come through last year i remember really i saw great. that yeah yeah, yeah. well Cross, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Good, thank you very much for your talk today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, well, it's thank really you. great that so many of you are interested. <laughs> so, uh, anything that you've got any ideas, please send them through sustainability and we'll try and put them on the list. We've got a list of 15 activities we're doing at the moment, and we this is just one of them. Um, and once they get going, the way that we operate, we have two or three people on our committee of 12 who look after a particular subject matter. And then we get the, the other members who are interested in come in and work with them. So um, we had a group of about eight uh, uh, getting the, the submission ready for, uh, for, for the EPD. And mm -hmm. now we have to regenerate it again with the stuff that we've got. But thank you all for coming. It's really good to see you here. Thanks, everyone. And, um, and please thank you. come up with some fantastic t shirts. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks again to everyone for zooming in. Uh, we're going to close the Zoom now. So have a great rest of your night. Thanks so much, guys. Bye bye. I don't know why not. That's great. Sean.